So what did we do um, last week? I've forgotten. It was a whole weekend in between. But we haven't done closed yet. We talked about open sets. So we, we spent all of Friday talking about different examples of open sets. And let me just say officially, there's a word we often refer to any open set containing a point A as a neighborhood. A or hood of A. The book may say something about how neighborhoods are usually balls, but in fact they can be any open set containing the point. So we'll, I will often use this language just because mathematicians use it, and I forget sometimes that not to use fancy words, so now you know the fancy words. Okay, so what I promised you on Friday we would start with is a discussion of sequences. So a sequence of vectors or points in Rn. So I don't care whether you think of them as actual vectors with arrows or whether you just think of them as points. I think it's probably better to think of them as points. Is what? What is a sequence? And notice I'm using a K here and not an N because we're in our N. So you don't want to use N both places. Um, in the book it said it was like basically mapping R, R, um, R1 to like Rn. So like every point in R1 has No, not, not R1. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. Natural numbers. So it's an, it's an assignment of a point, x of k, to each natural number k. So <coughs> those of you who would like to think more abstractly can think of that as a function from the natural numbers to Rn. What's the difference between the natural numbers R1? Natural numbers is just the counting numbers. One, two, oh, three, R, four, five. All, okay. And R, so this is just counting numbers. Yeah. R has all possible real numbers. Okay. So you might think of a picture of here's, here we are in Rn, and here's the point x1, and here's the point x2. That's, the sequence is just doing some sort of comet-like behavior wandering around. So you take a picture every hour for all on the hour for all possible hours, and wherever the comet is, there's the dot for that element of the sequence. <laughs> so what's what are some examples of sequences? Well, you could go back to stuff you did in in calculus for real numbers. So you could do you could do one over k, where I'm doing now real numbers, and that would be a sequence one one half one third one fourth dot dot dot. You could do more interesting sequence would be to take x of k. Notice I'm not putting vectors here because these are real numbers. One plus one over k to the k. We do have a few econ people around. You shouldn't. All people who want to make money should recognize that. <laughs> right. The, 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 this is how much money you have when you start with a dollar and you compound Infinite. at 100 percent interest, k times annually. This is how much money you have after a year. So you guys know something famous happens as k gets bigger and bigger. I'm about to talk about that. All right, here's a vector example. In R2, choose x1 to be the vector um, 1, 1. Let. So 
So let's just say, let me do 1 over root 2 times 1. one over root. So I start with a unit vector. Okay, there is x1. And now I'm going to take the matrix that does, keeps the first axis the same and doubles the second axis. And I'm going to take x2 is a times x1 and turn it into a unit vector. I'm going to take x3 is a times x2 and turn it into a unit vector. And continue that pattern. So what do I get? If I take this matrix and I multiply it by 1, 1, don't worry about the scalar for a minute. What do I get? No, no. What do I get if I take A times 1, 1? 1, 2. I get 1, 2 scaled. But I'm going to then make it into a unit vector anyway, so the scale doesn't matter. <clears throat> so I'm going to get the vector 1, 2 made into a unit vector, so I divide it by? Square root of 5. Square root of 5. And you can think through it, but the scaling will cancel out. It's irrelevant. What do I get if I do this again? 1, 3. <coughs> one, 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 so I multiply A by 1, 2. Forget the scaling. 1, 4, one, four over square root of 17. Yeah. 1, 4. And then I normalize it. So what, what are these, what's this sequence of vectors looking like? <coughs> so they're all unit vectors, so I'm somewhere on the unit circle in the plane. X1 is there, X2 is 1, 2, turned into a unit vector. X3 is 1, 4, turned into a unit vector. Any guesses? What do you think is going to keep happening as you keep going in the sequence? It keeps getting closer, closer and closer to the y-axis. Closer and closer to? Zero. Zero. One. The y-axis, so it's going to go to what limit do you think? I haven't used that word yet officially. Zero, zero, one. zero, one. Okay. So let's actually give that some definition. Definition. We say the sequence xk, and sometimes I'll put braces around it to denote the collection of all the xk's, and sometimes I won't bother. The sequence xk converges to A, written the way you're used to from calculus, limit as what does what? K approaches infinity. K goes to infinity. XK equals A. So the, so the words for this limit statement are the sequence converges to the point. If, so how can we restate that if you have the, this sequence of vectors, it converges to this vector or point A? What should that mean? When X when the distance X between X and A, A, XK and A is getting closer to zero. So as K goes to infinity, what should happen? Magnitude of X, Ma magnitude A, of XK minus A. Minus A. So the, remember we said the way you decide if two vectors or two points in Rn are close as you look at the magnitude of their difference. So that's what you're doing here. So this, now this is equivalent to saying, and we're going to have to, I'm afraid we're going to have to use this occasionally, so we're going to use a neighborhood. So we're going to say, what does this mean? It means if I draw a ball centered at A of any radius I want, what must be true about the sequence? So you can tell who's taken Math 3100 here. All you 2410 people should be fine too here. 
right? So I want to say, if I draw any ball centered at A, what must be true about the sequence? Eventually, all the elements of the sequence should be inside the ball. So how do we make that into math? <laughs> Given any positive radius R, now if it makes some of you feel better to put a Greek letter there, <laughs> go ahead and do it. Make sure you use the right Greek letter or you're going to get points off. Given any radius, eventually the tail of the sequence gets inside there. So what does that mean? Well, there is some capital K, which is a natural number, so that whenever little k is bigger than capital K, that means I'm far enough out in the sequence, what must be true about the point x of k? It's in the ball. It's in the ball. A. Centered at A of radius R. That's equivalent to saying that the distance to A approaches here. Because I can shrink that ball and I have to go farther and farther out in the sequence to get within the smaller and smaller balls. Okay, so for some of you, this is the first time you've seen math sentences like this, but trust me, you'll see lots of them. This stuff is not on the test. It'll be on the next test. Okay. Okay. So you have some homework to do that relates to, for example, suppose xk's converge to a. What do you think the magnitude of the xk's do? Converge to the magnitude of a. Converge to the magnitude of a. And that should follow in one line from a homework problem you did second week of school. 20 back to the inverse. Okay, so things to observe here. So in the examples we had, you took the sequence 1 over k, what does that sequence converge to? Zero. If I took the sequence 1 plus 1 over k to the k, that actually does converge e. The ubiquitous e. And you told me that the sequence we defined recursively by taking a times the preceding vector and making it into a unit vector in the example above. I didn't write it this way, but that was the recursion that we were doing here. And what you guys told me is that those vectors converged. We didn't prove it, but you saw geometrically they converged to what? Zero, one. Zero, one. When do I, what happens if I take the sequence given by negative 1 to the k? Real numbers. What does that sequence do? It doesn't converge, right? It bops back and forth between 1 and negative 1. It doesn't have a limit. Okay. So here's some things to notice. Suppose you have a, two sequences in Rn. So you, you might think about the x's over here. I guess I should color code it somehow. These are the x's. And over here are the y's. And I'm imagining that these each these sequences, each of them converges. Let's say xk goes to a and yk goes to b. Then, any guesses about what happens if I add and make a new sequence? Add the limits. Add the limits. And what about if I take the dot products of these vectors? Dot the limits. Dot the limits. Plus this. 
So just to give you guys a little bit of practice, and because you might have to do some stuff in homework that's similar in spirit, let's, let's actually do the proof of this one. How would I do that? Without using any fact cards. So you, 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 you've done these officially, so I'm going to keep you quiet for a while. You can write up the mathematical definition and then do something with that. So I'm okay with your working with either one of these, but somewhere you need to do some math to get to the point where you can use it. Limits. No, no, you don't get to just say. No, I know it's definition of limits. It's, uh, the limit of one thing as a plus another thing as a purpose of something is the sum of the limits. Well, I, but I'm asking for a proof. Right, we work with that. Right. No, and you're you're wanting to assume this to prove it, and I'm not going to let you do that. In calculus, in calculus, you used properties like this for real numbers all the time, and no one ever asked you to do a proof unless you were in Math 2400. This is, I mean, it's kind of cheating because I looked in the book. <laughs> well, so what, but let's just go back to basics here. So I'm given. So proof one would be given that the xk's go to a, what does that mean? That means that as k goes to infinity, the magnitude of the difference vector goes to zero. And similarly for the yk's minus b. What do we want? The, um, the magnitude of xk plus yk minus there you go. You, so you, this is like the subspace proofs you did and may do on the exam tomorrow. Remember we had a definition to check. So you remind yourself what you know and what you're trying to prove. I'm trying to show this. So I want to show that if I take the sum of xk plus yk and subtract a plus b, that that magnitude goes to zero as k plus b. So the question for you to ponder is how do I relate this quantity to these quantities? Distribute the negative and then regroup. Very good, Mallory. So note xk plus yk minus quantity a plus b is the same thing as xk plus yk minus a minus b. And Mallory's wanting me to regroup those things and put the minus a next to the xk and the minus b next to the yk. So I've got this sum vector that I'm interested in. And what I've realized is that if I look at how far xk is from a, and how far yk is from b, adding xk and yk, and then subtracting a plus b, should be adding these two vectors, the two difference vectors. And if they're both short, what should be true about their sum? It should be shorter. No. Or at least it should as the sum. Be short. It'll still be short, but not quite as short. Not quite. As what what quantitative It's shorter than the addition of the other. You can use the true inverse triangle inequality. Thou dost not forget triangle inequality tomorrow. By the triangle inequality. This is less than or equal to the sum of the magnitudes of the two pieces. And we know that these each go to zero. So I'm, I will allow you to write proofs like this if, if you want to do that. This goes to zero, this goes to zero, therefore the sum goes to zero. Why, therefore, does this left-hand side go to zero? It's less than or equal. Well, 
Negative five is less than zero, too. But it has to be positive. It's a magnitude of a vector, so therefore, implicitly, it's a non-negative quantity, and you're squeezing it so by a number going to zero from the top, and it has to stay non-negative, so it has to go to zero. Now, you're actually going to, in homework next week, you're actually going to prove the squeeze theorem that you used in calculus all the time. So don't, you're going to have to actually prove it. Okay, for those of you who would like to see how you work with the second definition, I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to do the same. Oh, except I just erased. No, I didn't erase. <laughs> so, given any number r, so this is the second proof. Given a number r greater than zero, I want to show that there's some capital K, so that when little k bigger than capital K, the vector xk plus yk is in the ball centered at a plus b of radius r. So think about it. It's going to be the same arithmetic that we did over here. By the same arithmetic we did, the distance between xk plus yk and the vector a plus b is at most what sum of distances? Xk, little k? Xk, xk, a plus b. Okay, the distance between xk and a and the distance between yk and b, the sum of those distances. Same picture I have. <coughs> Goal, I want to make this less than r. So you're going to play this game a lot if you haven't already done it in other math courses. How small should I make both of these to guarantee that this will be less than r? r over 2. If I make each of these less than r over 2, then the sum is r, which means this magnitude is less than r. So need it will suffice. You don't need this, but it will suffice to make each of these pieces less than an R over 2. Now, Dan likes to be ornery about such things, so I imagine he's going to use 3 eighths instead of a half, just because he doesn't want to be a copycat. I'd much rather be a copycat. Oh. <laughs> so tell me, do we know that we can guarantee that for large enough k, this is less than r over 2? Yes. It yeah. converges. By the definition. So there is a capital K, but we better be careful and give names appropriately here. There is a capital K sub 1 so that whenever I'm far enough out, namely k sub 1 far out in this sequence of x's. We'll make xk minus a less than r over 2. So far enough out in the sequence of x's, I'm within a ball of radius r over 2 here. And then I'll want to be within a ball of r over 2 maybe it's r over 2 around b as well. So what sentence should I write down for that? Similarly, there's a k2. There's a k2. See, I don't know if it's the same k. That's the part people often trip on. Mm -hmm. oh, no, well, I mean, I just think it's probably just the maximum. Say so what? You could just take the maximum one because I'm not the maximum. Right, right, right. You're a step ahead of me. 
So you so you, you you turn on your Xerox handwriting and copy the same sentence, substituting the small changes, right? Whenever K is greater than capital K two, we have magnitude of Y K minus B less than R over two. And now you say to yourself, so. How big does capital K have to be to make both of these happen simultaneously? Whichever one's bigger. Yeah. Or you can add them. Okay. Any number, take any K that's bigger than both of the K1 and K2. Then if you're far enough, if little k is bigger than this, it's bigger than each of those. So most math books, again, are going to be conventional and boring and say, choose capital K to be the larger of the two capital Ks. Bryce's suggestion that you add the two would work fine. Yeah. Then, K bigger than capital K implies that it's bigger than each of them. So both of these inequalities hold. And you get sort of tired of writing all this stuff, so it really does help to have a Xerox pen that you can make write out exactly what you already wrote. So I'm rewriting exactly what I did earlier. The distance between the sum and the sum of the limits is less than or equal to the sum of the distances. And we've said when you're bigger than capital K, each of these is less than R over 2. And so we're done. All right, I wanted to find a capital K that guarantees that xk plus yk will be in the ball where these are, center of A plus B, and I've now fulfilled that obligation. This is not a course where you're going to spend weeks of your life writing out arguments like this, but you will occasionally be doing arguments that are of that spirit. Any questions on that? Okay, one more little bit of fact here on observing things. There's an important property, which will come up occasionally, so I always forget to do it, so I'm not going to forget this time. The real numbers have a very important property. And that important property is that if you have a set of real numbers, so think of the real numbers as being on my number line here, going up and down, and if the set of numbers I'm looking at can't climb all the way to infinity, then there must be a bound to how high they get. And in fact, I can make that bound as low as I can. And that point is called the least upper bound of the set I'm talking about. So, Given any non-empty set of real numbers, that is bounded above. So I'm going to draw my real number line, as we were just saying. You've got some set, whatever it's doing, but it's bounded above. That means. So the official language for that is that there is some number capital M so that all the points in the set, any point x in the set, it's less than or equal to M. So all the things in my set S here are beneath M. And the property, it's called the least upper bound property, then there is a least 
such M called soup S. That's not Campbell's soup, it's soup as in super supremum. So soup of S is what's called the smallest upper bound or least upper bound. So what I can do is I can imagine letting gravity pull this M down as low as it can go. So M sort of wants to fall to the lowest place it can be. What stops it from falling all the way down? The set S stops it, right? So it can't, it can't fall any further than to be as close as possible to the highest things in S. <coughs> so you go, with, you, you take your upper bound and you let it go down until it can go no further, and that's called the soup. And this will come up occasionally in stuff we're doing in the course. It will come up a lot in the spring. We're doing integrals, so I wanted to say it. Mm -hmm. So were you said that like k is greater than k1, k2? Would Not k, here? Yeah. Would k max k1, k2 be the least upper bound of that set of k's? Yeah, so here we were actually doing integers. Mm -hmm. But if you had, absolutely, if you have any finite set, the max is the same as the soup. Okay. Now, in general, but that's a good question Matthias is raising. He didn't quite know he was raising it, but he really did. Is soup of a set always its maximum element? No. 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 All right, all you naysayers. Why are you naysaying? You've got an so open set that doesn't contain one. But it contains everything up to one. The max doesn't have a maximum value, but it's supremum is one. So you took the real numbers between zero, say, inclusive, and one, then there is no maximum number in that set. But the soup is the smallest number bigger than all the things in the set, which is obviously one, but it has no max. Good. Did that confuse things for you, Matthias? No. Oh, right. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give you the uh, long-awaited definition. So we had open sets, and I promised you closed sets. And these are going to be our main tool as we do all sorts of calculus and maximum problems and intervals and you name it. So by the end of the year you'll have forgotten that you never knew that you ever knew. That you'll have forgotten that you didn't always know these things. <laughs> Definition. S is a subset of Rn is a closed set. So we said open sets were ones in which every point had wiggle room. Closed has to do with being closed under limits. So that, it, so that if you have a convergent sequence of points in S, then the limit of that convergence sequence must also be in S. So if you have a convergence sequence of points in S, then its limit must also be in S. So that is perhaps a little on the verbose side. Can anybody suggest any? Better way to write that. For every sequence within S, 
that converges to A, A is within S. Yeah. So perhaps you'd rather restate it. I like that version. If for every convergent sequence with limit A, so suppose you have a convergent sequence and its limit is called A, A belongs to S as well. So obviously if I ask you to state a definition, I'm giving you latitude to state it in various ways as long as what you say is correct. So, do you think a closed interval in R is a closed set in R? Yes. So if you take the interval A, B, including endpoints, you always call that a closed interval. Is it actually a closed set? Yeah. Can you give me a, a rationale? Because there's no, all of these members of the sequence are within. So if I take any convergent sequence that lives in here. There's no one that can be. It can't converge out there? No. Yeah. We can't see it there. No, because it can, if the radius, if like, if that point is C, then the radius for less than C, uh, like, so you have a bunch of xk's, but they're somehow converging to, I don't want to use the letter a there, we'll use c, okay? So like b, if b is like the last one, right? right. b is like the limit on the right side. Yeah. Okay, so if you take a radius that's less than c minus b, then there's never a point, there's never like a Hills can't possibly subsequence of all. that sequence, which is less than Well, so if the sequence really converges to c, eventually it should be inside any neighborhood I pick of c. But that would mean that the XKs were certainly bigger than B, which violates how they were chosen. So that's a reasonable argument. Suppose, so Tony suggested this is a proof by contradiction. When you suppose you have a convergent sequence and the limit is not in S, well, to not be in S means that it's either less than A or it's bigger than B. So if we choose R to be C minus B, we take the distance from here to here, then we note that the XKs being less than B means no XKs are in the ball centered at C of radius R. Oops. You get that? If you're in the ball of radius R here, then all of the things in there are bigger than B. But all the XKs are at most B. So there can't be any in there. So that means a big convergence. Okay. I will allow you to say that was obvious in the first place. <laughs> okay. Is an open ball. Close set? I no, said it was open, so. I haven't ruled out that things could be both open and closed. That was different. Because if the limit of a sequence is on the edge of the ball, the difference is yeah. So you're imagining a sequence that goes to there, right. and all of them are inside the ball, but the limit is not. Yeah. Right. So if you wanted to make the ball into a closed set, what would you have to do? Add the boundary. Add the edge to it. We'll have official words for that soon. So set the ball of radius R around A with a bar over the B to be the set of points whose distance from A is now something less than R. What do you want me to say? Less than, less than or equal. So I'm going to put a 
red mark on the or equal to going with this red mark on top of the B. And I will tell you this is a closed set called a closed ball of radius R. So for our closing moment here, do you think there is some relationship between open sets and closed sets, other than saying an open ball isn't a closed set? Yes. Not necessarily. Put this in R2. Contain an open set in R2. Matthias. All open sets cannot be closed sets and vice versa. That's not true. Really? Okay. You're not going to like this answer, <laughs> but the empty set is both. <laughs> I knew you were going to like it. Of course. Yeah. If the set is closed, then everything outside that set would be open. Awesome. Proposition, which we will prove after the exam on Monday, I mean Wednesday, I mean. Proposition S. <laughs> is closed if and only if its complement, all the points that are not in S, is an open set. So the complement of an open set is a closed set, and the complement of a closed set is an open set. And that's, in fact, how you could convince yourself that this closed ball, when you put it in the edge, is closed, because if you take the stuff outside, the argument I, that you did in web work to see that I can find a neighborhood around any point out here that stays outside. So we'll talk about this all on Wednesday.